recorded session on um, interlinear gloss texts or um, conventions for our community. And the idea was that um, we all use interlinear glossing as a means to display our examples. And we do that um, in various ways, depending on the medium, depending on the type of publication. Uh, so if we're doing a text collection, we often have it maximally specified. If we're doing an article, we might reduce uh, the amount of information we give, but we all use that way of presenting our information. And the question that we wanted to ask is, uh, do we have any, have we thought through some standards for how we're doing this? Uh, if we haven't thought through those as a community of Sino-Tibetan linguists, then do we have conventions that we're using per subgroup? And um, there are obviously going to be individual variations, one because of the individual researchers, but also because of the languages that we're working on. But are there other types of other reasons for those variations? Philosophical reasons, are there reasons that have to do with the traditions that we have been studying um, in the people that we've studied with? And if so, how are those traditions making it more difficult for us to compare across those um, those things that we produce, those text collections, um, those grammars and so on. So, um, what we wanted to do is to first kind of lay out two or three reasons why we thought um, that it would be interesting to ask these questions. And have you go out into subgroups and investigate um, something about how GT is for your community, for your subgroup community. And I'm going to be talking more about that after we hear about uh, from, from Jim Matasoff about his own thoughts about annotation conventions and the ways in which you know, he's gone about uh, working on his Lahu text. So we'll first start with some very concrete um, and, individ and, and, and individual great individual for our field, uh, but one person's view of that and somebody that many of us have been influenced by. And then from that, we will go into um, our different corners and uh, look at some IGT and see, see what we see. So I will come back with some more instructions, but right now I want to really thank Jim for coming in to, to talk to us about this. Um, many of us have read your grammar, used your texts and uh, by the way, if, for those of you who are interested on the STED website, uh, we, you can hear many of the Lahu texts that Jim's been working on, I think. So um, it's nice to see them there. But thank you, Jim, for coming in and talking to us about this. And I, I'm going to turn it over to you now um, and remind everybody that there are handouts, two handouts, and they are in the chat for you to download and use. Uh, Shobana, may I uh, just to interject? Yes. Uh, you also, you mentioned the breakout rooms for uh, the different languages. I just wanted to ask everyone, uh, as you ready to enjoy and listen uh, to James's um, presentation, uh, we'll have seven breakout rooms. And so I'm going to list those here momentarily. And as you see them on the list, uh, please go ahead and respond with the room of your pr preference. So we're talking about Bodish, Bodogaro, Lolo Burmese, Naga General other languages of Manipur, Sino, and South Central TB, okay? So just- Can you uh, go over that list one more time? And then, uh, so for example, if um, Steve Moray wants to be working on, you may not see your most favorite language group, but uh, so if you see uh, Bodish, then you, and you hear that, you say, that would be interesting. Just type that in the chat. And um, Adam is going to gather all those together. And then when it's time for us to go to the, breakout room, he'll know where to send you. Thank you, Adam, for reminding me of that. I'd forgotten. So can you read the list of names out again, uh, uh, Adam? Uh, yes, I've got them in the chat room. So they're in the chat. Okay. Yes. And if you're left out, you don't have a choice. We will, we can, we can deal with that. Um, from the main room, we can send you on. So are we ready to start, Adam? Should we turn it over to Jim? Yes, please go right ahead. Great.
All yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my talk is called Window Onto a Forgotten World, Lahu Text from Thailand in the 1960s. This is what the title I'm going to give to, to the published text also. So in addition to my uh, comparative historical work on Tibeto-Burman, I've been rather preoccupied with the Lahu language for over half a century. As um, most of you know, Lao is a Tibeto-Burman language with seven tones closely related to Burmese, with nearly a million speakers concentrated in Yunnan province, Shan state of Burma, Northern Thailand, and Northwest Laos. There are also a few hundred Lahu now living in the US, mostly in the Visalia region of the Central Valley of California. I worked on Lahu during three major field trips to Northern Thailand in 1965, 66, 1970, and 1976, with many shorter trips since then. There had been a fieldwork tradition at Berkeley, notably upheld by my mentor, Mary Haas, that in order to do a respectable job of studying an exotic language, one should produce a grammar, a dictionary, and a collection of texts. This has been referred to as the Boasian trifecta in honor of the great anthropologist, Franz Boas, who was the principal originator of the idea of cultural relativism. So I have dutifully produced a grammar, the Grammar of Lahu 1973 and Dictionary, uh, Dictionary of Lahu 1988. The hundreds of texts I recorded in the 1960s are now in semi-final shape. In spite of some remaining problems with formatting, they've been accepted for electronic publication by Academia Sinica in Taipei, hopefully by the fall of 2021. In some ways, this third leg of the tripod is the most important of all, since my grammar and dictionary have depended largely on the analysis of these texts. My consultants were mostly Christian villagers in Northern Thailand, especially from a wonderful village called Hue Tak, about 60 kilometers north of Chiang Mai. I've actually taken several guests there over the years, including Boyden Martin and Graham Thurgood and actually Benedict also. Once the villagers figured out that I was uh, after natural speech, I would choose a topic, say building a house or picking tea or hunting crabs or whatever. And they would often act out little skits about it, even conducting rehearsals beforehand, often including sound effects like gunshots or dogs barking. It must be uh, admitted that I sometimes turned on the tape recorder while they were still rehearsing in order to get still more natural speech. A uh, word about equipment. Obviously my texts were recorded decades before the advent of computers. Uh, thus they were not born digital in that nice phrase I learned the other day. I had to rely on primitive reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and the recording conditions were far from optimal since village life did not come to a halt when I was there. The rice pounders kept up a rhythmic background, the cocks crowed all day long, the kids too young to work in the fields ran around shouting at play. But everything is relative. If we think of uh, the fieldwork conditions of my late colleague, Mari Emino, who died a few years ago at age 101 and a half, uh, his fieldwork in the 1930s on the Toda language uh, spoken in the Nilgiri Hills of India he had to use uh, a wire recorder, which uh, was pretty technically difficult to use, I guess. Um, and uh, sometimes he just had to have the informant repeat the same sentence time after time after time until he could write it down. It's a fiendishly difficult phonology in the Toda language. Um, by the way, I can't resist telling the story about what happened to these precious tapes of mine after we returned from Thailand in 1966. We were picked up at the San Francisco airport by my brother-in-law, also called Jim, who drove a little VW bug. There were four people in the car, so some of our baggage, including my tapes and, notebook and field notes, had to be crammed onto the, into the roof rack. Jim had neglected to bring bungee cords or twine, so we headed out to the freeway hoping for the best. Unfortunately, the suitcases soon flew off the roof onto the highway, spewing the reels of tape all over. But there was a happy ending. Uh, the martyred tapes were wrapped in a quilt and rescued from oncoming traffic and the magicians in the Berkeley Language Lab were able to restore almost all of them, although with some loss of their already not wonderful fidelity. Okay, genres of the text. The text cover a wide variety of genres, including discussions of serious topics, village life and customs, subsistence activities, free candid conversations, fables and edifying stories, myths and fairy tales, jokes and anecdotes, uh, bilingual humor is the subtype of that. These are jokes which revolve around a misunderstanding between, say, a black Lahu and a yellow Lahu, or between a Lahu and a Shan. 
uh, because of lexical problems. Um, also religious texts, pre-Christian, so-called theo-animistic texts. By theo-animism is meant animism, nature, nature gods and stuff, but above that a supreme being who you can't pray to, but who is viewed as a kind of supreme spirit. Uh, and also Christian uh, texts, of course, and songs, religious and secular, several hundred texts. A word about transcriptions. There are no fewer than four different transcriptions in use for Lahu. One of these, uh, developed by Catholic missionaries, is too complicated and is only used by a handful of people. So uh, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, the oldest one is introduced by Baptist missionaries uh, in China and Myanmar, dating from the late 19th century. They have good notation for the tones, except that the tonal diacritics appear one space after the vowel. That's not, not Rose, Jim. Should we text him? I don't really have. I, I have his phone number. Let me see if I can call him right away. <laughs> okay. It's been about 30 seconds. So. Yeah, it should. Un I'm going to also, maybe we can all get rid of our video just to lighten the load on our end as well. And while we're waiting, I'm going to give you the link to the IGT digest. I don't know how many of you got a chance to look at it. So you can go investigate. I think he's back. Okay. Yes. Do you know how to do? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I was getting a robocall and that ruined my. My, uh, my soul. Sorry about that. Ah. The robocall was, I think, me, Jim, but. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, okay, where was I? The different systems. Your, uh, your tapes were saved and. Uh, I'm talking about the different organizations. And the, yeah. no, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, one of the problems with the uh, Baptist system is that the tone marks are written uh, one space after the vowel. There are no hyphens between syllables of the same word, but it does have a lot of advantages. Uh, it uh, notates the tones accurately and so forth. The next one is the Chinese transcription, which is based on the same principles as the pinyin system for writing Mandarin, that is with arbitrary consonants uh, at the end of the word to indicate tones, which is possible since in native words, uh, there are no final consonants in Latin. And finally, there's my transcription, which is phonemic, but uh, it's kind of difficult to use. I've written about this, about my regrets on the score. Um, for example, I used unnecessary symbols known only to linguists like engma instead of ng, and s hachek instead of sh for sh. Also, uh, I phonemicize it so that uh, there are certain phonological rules which uh, you have to, the, the user has to apply. Like the five palatal consonants, j, ch, j, sh, y, all have dental allophones before barred i, yielding tz, 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 tz. And on the other hand, the labial initials p, p, h, b, and m are all affricated before u, yielding tz, 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 and l. N is parallelized to ny before i, but I just write it n i. In the Baptist orthography, both barred I and U are written as UH after palatals and labials, confusing the phonemic situation. Still, elegant phonemic analysis does not necessarily make a writing system easy to use. A big problem with my dictionary, which is a 1436-page job, is alphabetical order. I thought it would be cool to use a Devanagari-type uh, alphabetical order, uh, for the initial consonants like that of Thai and Burmese, that is starting 
with the back of the mouth and moving forward. So the postvelars, the velars, the palatals, labials, fricatives, and finally the lateral L. The nine vowels are also in a rough approximation of the Devanagari order, I, E, U, A, O, followed by E, A, U, and U. And the seven tones have their own order. So despite the fact that each page of the dictionary has the order of consonants, vowels, and tones printed at the bottom as a footer, it is sad but true that with a tiny number of exceptions, no Lahu can really use my dictionary with profit. My original idea was to publish the texts in such a way that users could pick their favorite transcription, but this tripled the size of the manuscript. The version in my transcription alone comes to about 1,200 pages. The new plan is to have three separate electronic versions, allowing the users to choose their favorite one. So over the past few years, a succession of talented graduate students working on my STET project have taught me how to use FLEX, a word, word by word glossing program developed by the SIL at UT Austin. Once you get to know it, it's a fine program, despite some bugs here and there. Okay, now we'll get to the um, presentation of the text themselves. Uh, each line uh, has is a, uh, a conglomeration of three, la uh, three items. First comes the original Lahu in, a, uh, in my transcription, then under this a form class designation, then under this a word-by-word -word gloss. After this, we get the free translation, and finally, notes on difficult or interesting points. So um, at this point, I feel I should offer a few apologies. Uh, I don't do PowerPoint, even though my younger daughter has repeatedly offered to teach me. But as I say in Chinese, uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, but uh, there are a couple of uh, handouts on the website. Uh, which contain a list of my form classes and then the two sample texts I'll be talking about. So, uh, as you can see, if you have the form class abbreviations in front of you, there's a large number of them, three pages or so, and they're fairly detailed. Um, yes, in fact, when uh, Odukur reviewed my uh, a Lahu grammar, uh, he, he was generally very uh, uh, positive about it, but he talked about my list of symbols and abbreviation. He says, alas, de dix pages, alas, 10 pages long. So I have made no effort to follow anybody else's conventions in form class designation. For example, the, the lingua system, which was devised years, decades after my own system was created in the 1960s. In my view, one size certainly doesn't fit all. One needs a more subtle system suited to languages like Lahu or Burmese to deal with phenomena like uh, pre-head and post-head versatile verbs, the classes of particles, uh, elaborate expressions, and so forth. Um, I should say, by the way, that uh, this was a period when genitor grammar was at its peak, and I was sort of swimming against the tide, resisting uh, their idea that all grammars were basically the same in a deep structure and there's no need to get more uh, data anywhere. I remember Robin Lakoff once said to me, uh, that's just data. Yeah. So um, this was a difficult period in the history of linguistics. Um, uh, well, I can say a few words about some of these grammatical phenomena I mentioned. Versatile verbs are similar to uh, auxiliary verbs, but there are dozens of them some with rather concrete meanings, not just modal meanings, for example. Um, their meanings as auxiliaries are sometimes quite similar to their meanings in isolation, but are often bleached or grammaticalized. Some of these verbs occur, occur before the main verb, the pre-head versals, but most of them after the main verb, the post-head versal. Um, for example, jia, to look for, or seek as a main verb, means to go and verb head, that's a pre-head versal. Be, to give as a main verb, means to uh, verb for a third person beneficiary or quasi when it comes after the main verb. As for particles, there are dozens of these and this is the core of the grammar. There are three basic subtypes, noun particles, verb particles, and unrestricted particles. Noun particles occur only after nouns, verb particles only after verbs, unrestricted particles after either nouns or verbs. Then there are subtypes of unrestricted particles also, those that appear only in non-final clauses, things that mean like if or when or although, they're called non-final unrestricted particles. Then 
those which appear in final clauses, which uh, include emphatic uh, uh, particles, like you get in many other Southeast Asian languages, uh, uh, quotative particles and declarative particles, and, uh, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, uh, these are categories which are specific to Lahu and to closely related languages. And I don't see any point in trying to uh, force them into somebody else's categories. Elaborate expressions are four syllable utterances uh, where either the first and third syllables or the second and fourth syllables are identical. Uh, and uh, so they're either ABCB or ABAC. Many of these are in everyday use, but uh, some belong to higher registers of, of the language. Okay, now big complications. Uh, one of the biggest complications is the fact that some morphemes fill more than one grammatical role, necessitating manual intervention in glossing. The most common particle, V, functions as a nominalizer, genitivizer, or relativizer. So each of the tens of thousands of its, its occurrences has had to be marked manually according to the meaning of V in each particular context. Besides this, there's a problem of homophony. Uh, since many unrelated morphemes have exactly the same phonological shape, including the same tones, these cases must also be glossed manually. A few examples, ma in the falling tone means either not or to be many. That's a rather important uh, difference. O in the low tone is a verb particle, meaning completed action or change of state, but as a noun particle, it's evocative. Pa can mean mountain, inside, or coiled up. La can mean tea or come. She means no, fruit or round object, or to lead. Uh, one can multiply examples at will. Uh, in languages of this eroded phonological type, with just a consonant, vowel, and tone, no final consonants, uh, homophony is rampant. So problems with the free translations is the eternal problem of how to stay as close to the original as possible without sounding stilted or unnatural in English. Um, often English pronouns have had to be supplied with the original lexicon. Sometimes, for example, it's hard to determine whether he or she or they is meant. Um, there are numbering discrepancies between the Lahu original and the free translations. One reason is my inconsistent treatment of quoted passages, which go on for multiple sentences. Uh, should each grammatically complete sentence be numbered differently, or should the whole speech turn get a single number? Should very short utterances like yes get their own number or be numbered the same as the following sentence? Also, how verbatim should it be? Should one record all the hesitation markers, all the uhs and, and hmms and, and stuff, or should they be lightly edited out? I finally decided to lightly edit them, edit them out in most cases. Uh, a problem with the notes. In the current version of the manuscript, footnote numbers only appear in the free translations, not in the Lahu texts. Ideally, the numbers should appear in both places, but how to do this has not been figured out yet. Okay, so finally the texts themselves. The first one I want to talk about very briefly is the little crabs who walk zigzag. And this is about based on a, this is an Aesop fable uh, introduced by missionaries, I'm sure. I'm sure you know the story. Is this mother crab who uh, is uh, giving her her many children lessons on how to walk, uh, and they they all walk along, and the mother says, "No, no, you're walking crooked. You should walk straight." And they say, "Okay, mother, show us how." And so the mother crab goes exactly the same way uh, as the baby, and uh, the baby say, "But you walk just the same as we do." So there's a moral to that story. You can figure it out. So anyway, it's a relatively simple text with only uh, 14 stories. I only wanted to mention a couple of little points here. D do you have it in front of you by any chance, the text? Maybe yeah, not. we've yeah. got it, yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, notice in sentence 7.1, this is on page four of the handout, uh, the sentence ends with the particle J, which is a quotative, quotative particle. And you get the same particle in 7.4, J at the end. And the same uh, particle in uh, 7.6, J. So what this does in uh, narrations of stories is to put a kind of uh, storytelling atmosphere into the whole 
thing. Like this is all something we've heard secondhand. These, these are traditional stories. It is said that. And yet it would be uh, terrible to translate every sentence that has J in it. It is said that because you, know, you don't have to do that. This is uh, a loud convention. Um, another interesting, uh, an interesting construction is in 7.6. Deke, deke, one animal after the other. Deke is one animal. Uh, be is a verb which means to finish, to be done. But in this idiom, it means having finished with one animal, you go to another animal, one animal after another. Um, in that same sentence, uh, you see the, uh, the verse, the post head verse of tzu, spelled C barred I, which is a causative here. Yakotsu made them walk on the road. Uh, tzu means to send on an errand as a main verb, but it gets bleached or grammaticalized after a main verb to mean causative. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's cognate with uh, the Chinese word shu, which means to send on an errand, uh, but uh, also can be used as a causative marker. Okay. Well, that's all I'm gonna say about the little crab. Um, if you look at the next text, how we came from Burma to Thailand, this one is more difficult, more interesting, um, much longer for one thing. I'll just mention a few of the points here. Uh, the first sentence uh, is translated. If you look at the free translation, which is on page 19, when we're fleeing here to Thailand from where we used to live in Burma, from where we used to live in Burma. The thing is, Lahu has no simple way of saying from. Um, the way you uh, express, there are various ways of uh, expressing it, but um, uh, it's not highly grammaticalized. And uh, one of the main ways of doing it is to say where the action began and use a verb after that. So if you want to say, uh, he fell down from a horse, and I gotta find my pages here. You say, which means on top of the on top of the horse he came falling down, meaning from on top of the horse he came falling down. You also notice there was a lot of audience participation in this text, like uh, one person hissed to the other in sentence 1.2. Uh, well, there's laughter there, the sound of laughter. And uh, in sentence 1.11, somebody says, don't laugh, because they're cracked up at this uh, unusual enterprise of recording, mm. recording, uh, recording text. Um, but I included those because that adds a certain realism to the whole thing. Uh, also, there are many elaborate expressions in this text. Uh, let's start with uh, 1.12, 1.12, which means to suffer hunger, hunger and cold. This is an A, B, A, C thing. The components mean had to be hungry, had to be cold. Uh, another one is, uh, 120, lo let lo cha, to beg for food. Lo means to beg, let means to lick, literally, or to uh, eat something enjoyable, like sugar cane or something like that. So that means uh, to beg to eat for snacks and to beg to eat, lo let lo cha. But let and cha are sort of synonyms there. Um, sentence 1.28, ha ve ho ve, poor and wretched, ha means difficult, or uh, uh, yeah, poor. Uh, Ro only occurs in this combination. I translated wretched. Um, and a very common one in 1.31, hale haka, happily, or at ease. Uh, hale means happy by itself. Uh, nobody knows, I don't know anyway, what the ka means, but it's there for symmetry. So this is a very striking feature of, of, uh, of Lahu. And uh, some speakers manipulate these elaborate expressions with uh, great fluency. So um, maybe that's enough. 
to uh, give you a rough idea of the, the agonies and the ecstasies of uh, involved in preparing material of this complexity for publication in a way that's accessible and enjoyable, not only for outside linguists, but also for the speakers of the language themselves. And I feel that uh, thus far, I've fallen far short of making it uh, easily accessible to the native speakers. And uh, I can only say that was what the situation was like uh, 60 years ago. So uh, if I had it all to do over again, I would do it differently. But anyway, it is what it is, as our dear president said. So uh, that's where we are. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, I think it was a great uh, a way of us starting to think about um, our own practices in animation because you brought up so many of the things that we also face when we're working on Tibeto-Burman languages, Sino-Tibetan languages, the issue of grammaticalization, polysemy, um, and the idea of one size doesn't fit all. So what I'd like to do at this point is, uh, would anybody have, does anybody have any comments or questions before we go on to our actual workshoppy type of event here? Well, Jim, the Hale Hakka reminds me a little bit of uh, the Tibetan um, Hale, which is like a, um, an expression of a joy or excitement or amazement. Um, and it's been borrowed into Stao um, also as well. And you can use a, um, a directional um, prefix in between Ha and Le, and you get Ha Dele. But I don't know if that's anything uh, related. Well, I, well, that's interesting. But uh, that compound, ha is actually analyzable. Uh, ha means soul or spirit, and le means warm. So it makes, you, makes your spirit feel warm when you're happy. I think that's, that's what they told me. And in this case, I think their etymology is correct. So uh, that could just be a coincidence of the similarity to Tibetan. Right. Yeah, good point. Can I make a suggestion? Um, is anybody can you hear me? Yes. Um, the you know as if you listen to Jim the way he was talking, um, he's defining these particles, but all of the particles are actually the glossing that you're giving them is defined constructionally, uh, rather than these things. I I'm becoming more and more kind of sus um, and not, not empty. Well, and not so comfortable with the whole structuralist approach to to doing these kind of things, and and uh, kind of more adopting a constructionalist approach. Because if you look at the history of languages, all the, the grammaticalization of the uses of these um, morphemes and whatnot is all within constructions. Uh, grammaticalization occurs within constructions. It's not an individual morpheme that grammaticalizes out of the blue and it, it's always within a particular construction. So if you think of like go in English, it's only in the construction I'm going to see the king that this gonna, gonna can, can grammaticalize. But in other contexts, other constructions, go is simply just a full verb. And if you listen as Jim was talking, each, each one he defined in terms of its function and meaning, he did it on the basis of where it occurs in the construction and, and how it's used in the construction. So one other way of doing it, I don't know if this is possible computationally, but something to maybe think about is rather than trying to say that each morpheme has a particular form class or, or whatever uh, meaning, um, to see things more in a constructionalist sense. Because even like if you read Zhao Yunren's grammar of Chinese, he actually kind of acknowledges um, that the meaning really depends on the construction. Uh, he talks about like guai uh, and uh, how it's different uses. It has completely different uses and, and meanings in different contexts. But as a structuralist, he insisted on having to give it some kind of form class label. Um, uh, whereas an earlier Chinese linguist called Li Jinxiang had just said that you just uh, determine it based on how it appear, where it appears in the clause. And, and I, so um, if you look at the same words, uh, it, depending on where you put them in it, especially a language like uh, Chinese or Lahu or something, these uh, languages that don't have morphological change uh, 
when they're used in different locations. Uh, it all depends on where it occurs in the construction, and that's how you understand it. So if, if, for example, a word, whatever the word is, appears in a topic position of a clause, it's going to be understood referentially. If it occurs in the predicative position of the clause, it's going to understood, be understood predicatively. It's that simple, really. Uh, so I don't know if that would be useful computationally. Um, I, I really have a problem with this idea of kind of um, assuming that there's some kind of abstract world in which these uh, abstract kind of form classes and say, okay, this word is this form class in some abstract world, but in reality, it can also do these other things. I, I don't know where that's helpful. Um, and, and I'm kind of uncomfortable with uh, computation approaches that, that do all this tagging and force particular um, tags onto, uh, uh, onto natural texts. I mean, you can do it post facto, but not, you know, a priori, just as deciding that, okay, this word is a certain form class. You have to see how it's used. Sorry. Well, sure. And what are the, what are the same? I'm not, I'm not criticizing Jim. I think Jim's got it right. It's just because he was also trained structure as a structuralist. He, you know, had to do this building block kind of uh, thing where you get the, the form classes, but or maybe that's why I have so many different form class designations because I really that uh, you have to have so many subtypes according to the particular construction mm. something's in. Um, right. And for me, also position in the clause is important. Some particles are right. No, that's what I'm saying. The way you you actually talked about them was constructionally, but because of your training, you also had to give that a particular name of as if it existed externally with that name. But it's really all of your the way you talked about it was all constructional. So all I'm saying is we're just recognizing what we've really been doing all along, which is right. recognizing that, that it's the constructions that define the functions. But then the whole notion of word by word interlinear glossing uh, uh, would- I know, that's what I'm saying. I don't know if it's possible to, hmm. go ahead, sorry. That's sorry. I think that that is exactly like the, the point of it is that there is a, there is a theory behind what we're doing and we're doing it without thinking. Uh, we're taking a lot of interlinear texts and we're, we're uh, chopping things up in different ways. So if we did it the way that you're suggesting, Randy, we would still have to have a theory of where those constructions begin and end. What is a construction? And you know, how do we justify glossing that one thing in the clause as a, as a constituent or a unit? Do we just by function, but then what is, you know, how do we delimit where the beginning and the end of that well, no, I'm, I'm not saying that you can't delimit it. There, there is, you know, the, the structuralist approach assumes this building block where you have to kind of reductionist, right. re, you know, reduce it down to these morphemes and then try to build back up from that. But um, what I'm saying is you started at the higher level and then you work down, which is the way we actually do work. Um, we, we actually do take the text as a whole and then start chopping it up just like a child does when they learn the language, they learn the chunks and then break it up later on. And that's how we, we learn the languages as well. And so that to me is fine in terms of identifying in the natural text, uh, as Jim did, you know, where you're saying work doing manually is identifying in each context what it means. But what I'm, I think the reason why I'm mentioning this is it seems that this has some kind of computational motivation here where we're trying to define things ahead of time that a computer can then just recognize. And what I'm saying is that may not be that possible. Yeah, let me share with you what the motivations are. And I think that's part of it. And part of it has to go, goes back to, let me do this screen sharing first, which I can't do chew gum and screen share. All right, um, you don't need all of all of this material here, but let's just go through it very quickly. So, um, that okay. So the reason that we're trying to do this, part of it is exactly, Randy, you've kind of hit on that, is saying that if we want to compare across different related languages, when we do that comparison. And when things line up, we learn something. Okay, we're reinforcing, yes, this is the way that noun phrases work in these languages. 
This is the way that participant marking works in these languages. That's when things line up. Also, when things don't line up, we learn something. Oh, language two has taken all the auxiliaries and made them into um, affixes of some sort or uh, any other way in which languages that are closely related happen to have something slightly, slightly different. And that always happens. There's always something that's different and we learn something. Um, and also key to the fact that what we're learning is really something special. So what I would like to go back to here is the notion of those people who have not been working on annotated texts yet. This may not be a population that we're thinking of in, in, this, in this setting, but it's one that I talked about at the Corso meeting and I'd like to bring that up again. I have had um, linguists in India talk about the difficulties that they're facing in doing annotated corpora because they don't find enough guidance in how to do it. And they're saying, well, we're using Leipzig glossing rules, but that's not enough for us. We don't really know what the traditions are. And I thought, oh, okay, what have we done? Um, what, have, what kinds of parameters have we set out other than large typological descriptions that might give some guidance there? So one of the things, um, additional things is this whole thing of when you're comparing against a, a one language to the other and you find that something doesn't align, that you realize that you've found something special and then you can write about that thing. And if you've noticed many of the grammars that come out of, of India don't know how to do that because they're doing this kind of cookie cutter, let me tell you what the words are and where the sounds are and so on. So one of the things that, the reason that I started thinking about this is really this, this idea of giving people some guidance how to work in cookie chin languages in Northeast India, very, very small, perspective that I, that I started out with. After that, we um, did start to talk with our computational linguistics friends, Alexis Palmer, uh, Tarak Rama, who both work here and others, on, um, on how we could collect IGT from related languages and do comparison across those languages to improve the description of those languages and then also perhaps wrap more rapidly do the description of languages that haven't been discovered yet. And then I shared that I don't really have that much agreement that's gonna make it simple to compare across. As you were pointing out, Randy, a lot of times we have um, perhaps something that's been labeled as a noun, but it's used in many different ways, not as a noun, but somehow verbally and so on. So um, was like, could we stop and, and think about what are the IGT practices within the groups? Are there some things that we can, not even to say what needs to happen, not to say they need to be standardized, uh, but to just discover where, the, where there's misalignment. So there's some very clear things that we have. Um, somebody's in the waiting room, Adam, and uh, you could you- Okay, I, I will get that. Okay, um, there is um, there are these very simple things like where are the word boundaries? And if you look at um, the way that Jim writes, that's very easy because we've got one morpheme per with white spaces. Um, but there seems to be a lot of variability in the Christian world. Definitely, even if you look at Manipuri linguists uh, and the way that they use word and what they define as the word, or if they've even kind of theorize, conceptualize what they're, what they're putting down on paper when they make those white spaces. What are they claiming with those white spaces? Um, how are dashes used? Are they used, for example, if you look at compounds and reduplicated forms, in Jim's example, I noticed there was the reduplicated forms are written separately, um, or maybe there was a reduplicated form with a dash and then, but there was like A, B, A, B, and then A, B and A, B are not, uh, they're, they're dealt with as if there were two separate forms and that's perfectly valid way of doing it, but people seem to do it differently depending on, I don't know why, but because I think there's no standard on how to do that. Um, same thing with compounds. Um, a lot of people don't use uh, equal signs for enclitics. They, they have them, again, sitting separately as a separate morpheme. So what is, what is that? Um, it is, where do we define that? Where do we say what, what is an enclitic? or is there such a thing? Are we just saying that there isn't such a thing and so on? And also our line divisions uh, are 
quite erratic. Like sometimes when we're looking at the way the texts are broken up, they're broken up by clauses, um, they're broken up by phrases, um, or they're not at all broken up. There's just um, the word, the the words just kind of are in the page until you get to a finite verb. Concrete things that we can look at, and that's one of the things we wanted to ask: is can we look at I just the syntax of how that's done? Uh, one thing that we were wondering about is the gloss and what is um, what is determining how people gloss things. Does it have to do with the theoretical tradition that they came from? So here's one that none of us want to see probably, but something like specifier or, or tense phrase or, or, um, or other. I think it was Christine Hildebrand who was pointing out that um, many of the, the, the things in Bodic come from a tagmemic tradition and sometimes are very hard, hard to read. Perhaps that's both syntax and glossing that we would look at there. There are um, things per subgroup, conventions per subgroup that one could look at as standards for that subgroup, um, still allowing for variation between different languages. So if I wanted to put together a primer for doing glossing for a cookie chin language, could I do that? Could I at least have some, some basic standards? Um, are there differences between the way we gloss depending on which schools we come from? The Berkeley School, Latrobe, UT Austin, uh, some things that we've you know created since we've been to school. And so, are there um, where are those differences between the ways that we in the same subgroup do things? And are are there things that we can just discover and then figure out if we we can change or make make them um, more similar if that's useful? And then the last thing I think I believe there's one there are two more parameters. So was syntax. The other one was annotation. The other one, how we deal with polysemy or grammaticalization. Do we do we gloss things um, similarly because we know where they've come from? Do we gloss them differently because we know their functions are now different? Do we recognize um, uh, do we recognize their synchrony or do we recognize the di diachrony? Um, or do we confuse the two? Uh, sometimes doing one and sometimes doing the other. And then finally, one thing that seems to be very varied across all of our um, glossings have to do with um, called the information structure, and you can add a lot more in here or, or think of these not belonging here, but uh, the way we're doing differential marking, foregrounding, highlighting topic, and all of these, basically because we're still trying to really understand how these work in these different languages. So these were four parameters that we thought would be interesting to, to look at. And definitely the kinds of things that you've brought up, um, Randy would be would think to come back and discuss again once we've gone out mm. and looked at some examples. What we're gonna try to do now is to go out to our separate rooms and we only have half an hour. So it's hardly time to say, what are we doing here? <laughs> so you, you go to your separate rooms and then you say, what are we doing here? Well, what are you gonna try to do yeah is to access the folders that we've built where we've put together some examples of interlinear gloss texts for these different language families and see what you see and see if there's anything there to really discuss or where can we go forward in this at attempt to first of all, describe what's happening with IGT in our subgroups and perhaps make some recommendations like what, you, what Randy was saying, why don't we consider doing it in a constructional way? So let's see where we can progress. And so our goal is not to solve anything right now, but to just get you interested in the topic. Um, when I gave a presentation on this at SOAS in December, um, I think David Peterson and Zachary and um, um, who else was there? Um, Linda Connerth. And they were like, ho-hum, this is really boring. It took five minutes of going into it and they were like, okay, we see why you're doing this and it is kind of interesting. And I wonder why this person did this way and this person did this other way. There's analysis behind it. There's, there's a theory from the mind of the analyzer for why they put things down. And so it seems like it may be interesting to discuss, but maybe it's not. Let's give it half an hour of looking at. And um, you're all such great minds and, and have done a lot of this yourselves. And so I'm interested to see what I have to report. So to our rooms, there's a sheet on that drive that has these four parameters listed. 
you don't even really need that sheet. You already know what those are. Somebody assign somebody uh, as the note taker. And when we come back, uh, each person won't have more than say three or four minutes, maybe five minutes at the most to report back um, what, what your group discussed. So at How do you get into the chat room? Um, Adam is the got the power now, and he's going to put into those okay. groups. And uh, also, there will be a student worker who will guide you to the um, the digest. We call them the IGT digest, if you're able to find them. Okay. Thank you so much, and have a good time for half an hour. And. <laughs>